Welcome to a bonus episode of D&D Builds. Usually we make all sorts of ridiculous character builds, but this is going to be a little different. Like so many people out there right now, I have been absolutely obsessed with Elden Ring and been playing it non-stop. So I wanted to figure out how to make your D&D game more like Elden Ring. We'll jump into how to make the overall difficulty scale up as a DM. And don't worry, I'm not just going to crank up the CR of absolutely everything and make everybody just constantly fight Tarasks, because that just wouldn't be entertaining. How to translate most of the main bosses into D&D &D creatures. And then, finally, how to handle some playable characters, as well as covering all those spells and incantations. I mean, they shouldn't be too hard to translate, right? There's only... Oh, f***. There's over 160 different spells and incantations. Apparently, I don't like just torturing myself when I play video games. I like adding crap loads of editing to my own plate. So we'll try and figure out how to cover as many of them as possible and just dive in. So welcome to D&D &D Builds, where we make all sorts of ridiculous builds for Dungeons and & Dragons and hopefully stop driving the people in our lives insane with them. If you're a DM and the first thing you want to do is make your table a bit more Elden Rings-like or pretty much any FromSoft Souls-like game, we gotta scale up the difficulty. D&D &D has a kind of overly easy form when it comes to going to zero health, so that's the first thing we gotta address. What I would suggest is reduce the death saves. You want to make it a little more difficult? Make it so there's only two death saves instead. If you fail the first one, you lose all the experience you gained progressing to the next level. And then if you fail the second one, you're just dead dead. I'm sure that'll get a few people raging, but if you want to add some difficulty, that's a killer way to do it. So now let's figure out how we convert most of these bosses, at least the main story ones, and a few of the bonus ones, into D&D creatures. We'll try to use just official creatures in D&D &D and make just a few alterations here and there to make them a little more accurate to what pops up in Elden Ring. So the first big boss you come across is Margit the Fell Omen, but he pops up again later as the Omen King. So we'll circle back to him when we come across him for the final round. Then you come up against Godric the Grafted. He has two phases, like many bosses in Elden Ring. I would say his first phase is kind of like going up against a Dire Troll because he has a Whirlwind type attack, and Dire Trolls have access to Whirlwind of Claws. This is a CR 13 creature, so it's going to be pretty tough to fight, so I would probably get rid of its regeneration ability to make it a bit more accurate, but I think overall it fits pretty well. Then for Phase 2, there's something that I was so excited I found, which is the Dragonflesh Grafter. It's Godric the Grafted, and I found a Grafter that actually graphs to a dragon, and that's exactly what he does in his second phase. Granted, the Dragonflesh Grafter spews acid instead of fire, so that's the one alteration we would have to make with this creature. The second boss I came across was Rinala, Queen of the Full Moon. She's probably one of the easier ones to make, but hard to find something that's super spot on in the creature list from D&D. This one would be pretty customized, but I would probably start with a Githzerai Anarch. If they're used as a boss, they have a lair action referred to as Psionic Bolt, which is a slightly altered form of Lightning Bolt, but you can change the damage type to pretty much anything. They also have a lair action called Move Object, where they can magically move an object that they can see, and that seems pretty fitting for what all of Rinala's disciples do when you're fighting her in her first phase. Then just throw in a handful of summons and you've got Rinala. I know it's not super spot on to a creature that's already built, but we'll try and stick closer to that with as many of the other creatures as we can. Then we have Star Scourge Radon. I had a hell of a lot of trouble with him the first time around, and I didn't even realize that this enormous behemoth of a man is actually riding around on a very normal sized horse. And I can't get the image out of my head now, and it just seems ridiculous to me. Since we don't really have to worry about his increased speed because that actually is because of a horse, I would say the closest fit we have is Orcus. It's a super high CR, and that fits because I definitely had some trouble with him initially. Orcus is a CR 26, which is pretty massive, but he has access to Necrotic Bolt, which is what we can substitute in for the massive boulders that are hooked at you 
along with those bolts that practically kill you in one hit, as this necrotic bolt is a ranged spell attack with plus 15 to hit and deal 5d8 plus 7 necrotic damage. He also gets access to Circle of Death, and that works pretty well for when he does that big circle around him. He also has the lair action Deadly Utterance, which allows Orcus's voice to boom through the air, which can also substitute for this booming effect. It can cause one creature to be subject to the power word kill. Additionally, he has the ability to create undead servants. And the one alteration I would make here is that maybe the undead servants are actually working against him. That way, it's very similar to the fight with Star Scourge Radon, where you're constantly summoning friends to help you out. But then you come across Morgoth the Omen King. Previously the fell omen, but now he's busting out the big guns. And I was gonna try and make sure I just include the spell Blade of Disaster, because that seems to exemplify the badass sword he has, but I didn't really have that much trouble with him, so I wouldn't give him that hard of a hitting attack. However, I would still make him pretty difficult overall. You might want to tone down this creature a little, but I would choose Grazd. I think that's how you say it, similar to how you pronounce Drizd, but whatever. The Grazd is a large demon. And the fact that it's a demon kind of makes sense because Morgoth has these horns growing out from all over him in kind of a grotesque manner. But he has a Wave of Sorrow, which is a great sword. When you hit with this, it does plus 13 to hit, has a 10 foot reach, and it deals 46 plus 6 force damage, plus another 4d6 acid damage, which is a pretty solid hit, and I think it's just tough enough to make him an Elden Rings boss. Then next up, I actually came across the God Devouring Serpent. This one's a boss that has a catch. You get a special item right at the beginning that's specifically made for fighting him. And with that in mind, you don't have to stay within the boundaries of a normal creature. In D&D, there's something very specific that works here. Since he's known as the God Devouring Serpent, there's a great old one that fits perfectly. Dendar the Night Serpent, older than many of the gods of D&D and often more feared. Warlocks make a pact with Dendar the Night Serpent, and it usually appears in the dreams of the warlocks that make a pact with him. He is sort of the all-encompassing idea of everybody's nightmares in D&D. So if you wanted to throw him into your campaign, just make sure you have a specialized item that happens to work perfectly for defeating him. Then next up is the Fire Giant. This one's pretty easy because there's just Fire Giants in D&D. But I would more specifically choose the Fire Giant Dreadnought. The Dreadnought version of Fire Giant has the ability to slam the shit out of people with his shield. And that happened to me far too many times. Then in his second phase, he spews out giant boulders and fire, and fire giants have the ability to do a rock throw. Granted, it doesn't do much fire damage, but it still spews out giant rocks, and if you wanted to alter this a little bit and just add some fire damage on top of the rock throw, I think that'd be pretty fitting. They do a solid amount of damage with the rock throw being 4d10 plus 8, and you still get some fire damage from your fire shield. So it does mix up the moveset slightly, but it still really works pretty well, and I think this is the best fit we have. Another option if you didn't really want to stick too much to the fire giant aspect, there's a creature called a Borbora, Borborigimos, Borborigimos, I guess? It still has the rock throw ability that the fire giants have, and it has a stomp ability that works pretty well. You'd be forfeiting the shield, but it's just an alternative in case you don't want to go too spot on. Then next up you come across the godskin duo, and there's nothing particularly special about these two, so we can kind of ignore them. Really, it's just that there's two of them, there's a lot of health, and they attack pretty relentlessly. Next up, we have Malaketh the Black Blade. Since he is kind of a beast cleric, I really wanted to find a beast that would fit this, but unfortunately, there's not very many that would be remotely close to a high enough challenge rating to fit in. So there's something I found instead called Goristro. It's actually a demon, but it is very beast-like when I look at the character art, and it has the ability to charge at you, and it does make three attacks at a time, so it's pretty relentless. The only difference is that you'd have to give it a sword instead of one of its fist or hoof attacks. And that's just a matter of changing the look a little bit. Next up, you'd probably come across Sir Gideon Ofnir, 
the all-knowing. This is surprising that he's this late in the game, as he's pretty much just a basic wizard. So you can really throw in pretty much any wizard creature and just make it fit. I'd probably just take a basic evoker wizard, bump up the CR by giving him a couple more strong spells, and call it a day. And then before we get to the final bosses, we gotta talk about a couple of the optional ones. We have Mog, Lord of Blood, and I think he works perfectly well with Baphomet. Visually, as far as the face goes, it looks pretty spot on. He's the Prince of Beasts, but we can just alter that to instead of being a prince, more of a lord, and instead of being a beast, we do it of blood. I had a lot of trouble with this boss, but he's a CR 23. It works pretty well. And to fit in with the Lord of Blood aspect, he already has the ability Heart Cleaver, which deals 2d10 plus 10 force damage. And since some of the Mog Lord of Blood's abilities are pretty damn hard to avoid, unless you have just the right items. The fact that this is force damage is kind of fitting, since it's pretty hard to be resistant to force damage. Then on to Millennia, Blade of the Makella. And I actually had a great idea for what to do here, considering she has some insane combos and just relentlessly attacks. I was going to choose a Merilith for her first phase. Merilith gets seven attacks, and that seemed super fitting. And then, as I was starting to work on the idea for what is her phase two that's just some sort of Naruto style nine tailed fox, another character entered the picture. This absolute unit, this god among men, this supreme Chad came in and just wiped the floor with her. He's known as Let Me Solo Her. He has become an absolute legend in the Elden Ring community. His name is purely dedicated to the idea of let me take her on just by myself. And he does it wearing nothing but a jar on his head. Not only that, but he often does it without taking a single hit. So I gotta give him a special little shout out here. And usually I don't stat gods, but we have to figure out some sort of way that you can utilize him. Considering he's not wearing anything, at least other than the jar, and he's wielding a couple swords that are known to scale with dexterity, I would definitely make him a monk. That way you can get the unarmored defense, max out your dexterity and wisdoms, so that way you have some extremely high AC. And then I would go variant human so that way you can dual wield those swords that you have and pick up the feet dual wielder, which will boost your AC by one while you're wielding two weapons. So your AC would be 21. And you can use weapons that aren't light. So considering that the swords that Let Me Solo Her tends to use are a bit longer, I'd actually like to use a long sword, and the only way we can do that while still using dexterity is being a monk Path of the Kensai. This allows you to choose some Kensai weapons, and then you can use dexterity for those weapons. And since you almost never get hit playing this absolute god of a character, you can also use Agile Parry, which gives you another plus two to your AC until the start of your next turn, making your AC 23, which is pretty damn hard to hit. Then if you want to have an ability to activate the bleed effect that he seems to utilize, make sure to use your Death Strike and Sharpen the Blade. That will boost your damage for a single hit and boost it pretty well. One with the blade's Death Strike allows you to spend a key point to deal one additional martial arts die as part of your damage, and then Sharpen the Blade allows you to add an additional plus three on top of that, which is pretty big when it comes to D&D. Sharpen the Blade lasts for a full minute, but Death Strike only works on a single attack. Then we finally get to the last three bosses. Huara Lu, the warrior, has two phases, and it's kind of like fighting a barbarian. And if anything, I would say it's more of like a beast barbarian. The whole idea of a beast barbarian is that you have a spirit of a beast within you, and he definitely has the spirit of this lion or whatever it is within him. He swings a giant great axe at you in the first phase, and that's very barbarian-like. While most of these would be a basic creature you could find in a monster manual, I would actually make this a full built player character, which I've actually done as a DM a handful of times. It takes a tiny bit more work, but considering how late in the game you would be facing him, I think it's still okay to do. Take the Beast Barbarian, use a Great Axe for the first phase, and then finally go full beast mode for the second phase. 
just relentlessly attacking with your claws and fists. You have resistances to so many types of damage when you're a barbarian in rage, so I think having this towards the end of your campaign is kind of cool. Then, after you defeat him, you wind up at Radagon of the Golden Order. He does a bunch of holy type attacks, so in order to fit this pretty well, I would grab a Solar. It's a large Celestial, and it's CR 21. High enough that you can boost it a little bit if you want to make it a little more challenging. Radagon has resistance to holy damage, and the damage resistances of a Solar include Radiant, which is pretty much one for one translation. Radagon deals plenty of holy damage, and Solars have the feature Angelic Weapons, allowing them to deal an extra 68 radiant damage to any attack. They only make two greatsword attacks, but I think this works pretty well. They also have the ability to use a slaying longbow, and I think if you boost him up a little bit, he'll be great for a second to last boss. Then you come across one of the bigger bosses in the game and the final boss overall, which is really just a giant starry newt. But considering its salamander-like form and the fact that it is kind of made of stars, I like the idea of translating this over to a astral dreadnought in D&D. The size matches up as an astral dreadnought is titanic size, and you can recreate some of the Elden Ring abilities, like throwing out radiant damage by slightly altering the astral dreadnought's abilities, such as psychic projection, which just lets out a bunch of damage psychically, but you can just transfer it from psychic damage to radiant damage. It also has this unique feature called Astral Entity, meaning that the Dreadnought can't leave the Astral Plane. And I think this works pretty well because you can only face the final boss of Elden Ring in this weird astral atmosphere. So I think that's as close as we'll get with most of these core bosses. Now on to the player characters. There's a direct translation for most of these starting classes in Elden Ring to what you would see in D&D. Since Elden Ring allows you the complete ability to adjust as you need, we can't do a complete one-to-one -one scenario, but we can translate the starting classes. Starting off with the hero class, considering its high strength, endurance, and vigor, plus the massive as hell great axe that it wields, I would definitely go with a barbarian. The hero class also doesn't really have much armor to start, but the great axe itself has this ability to just kind of wildly swing, and that's pretty close to having a reckless attack that a barbarian would have. Next up, we have the bandit, and the bandit's pretty obviously a rogue. It's all about sneaking around using your shortbow or your dagger, and I can't think of a single thing that's nearly as close as being a rogue. Next up, we have the astrologer, and the astrologer deals pure magic damage. It puts plenty of points into intelligence, so of course we're gonna go wizard. Next up we have the warrior. The warrior has high dexterity and dual wields weapons. And considering they don't really have any starting spells or any sort of ranged abilities, I would just go with a fighter. You can focus on dexterity as a fighter and you can dual wield weapons, especially with that fighting style. Next up we have the prisoner. They only get one spell, but it's actually a really good one. And considering they seem to have been locked into a helmet, it's almost like they made a deal that just did not work out for them very well. So I would go with a Warlock. Warlocks have some limited spell ability and often enter into a fairly rough deal. Next up we have the Confessor and they're all about faith. So obviously we're going to go Cleric but they happen to have a particular spell to start called the Assassin's Approach, which definitely has a focus on being sneaky. With that in mind, I wouldn't just go with a cleric, but I would go with a trickery cleric, because they're kind of the rogues of the cleric world. Next up, we have the Wretch, and they're pretty much as baseline as baseline gets. But because they start at level 1, have very baseline stats, and have a simple club as a weapon, you can either choose to go with a monk or a barbarian. You're not wearing any armor, so either one works pretty well. Next up, you have the Vagabond. And this is all just about skill and wielding a pretty kick-ass weapon. You have decent strength and dexterity and vigor. With that kind of mix, and you're wearing considerable armor, I would go with Fighter again. This allows some versatility, and you can choose your own fighting style to fit your needs. Next up, we have the Prophet. And this is very obviously a cleric again, but this time you have some flame spells. So with that in mind, despite the fact that you don't really start with any real armor, I would actually take the Forge Cleric. They have more access to fire spells, and that's kind of what you need with this build. You still have the ability to heal, which 
pretty much every cleric and prophet can do. And then you'll just have to focus on getting that armor to appease your forge cleric god a bit later. Then last on the list we have samurai. And this is so straightforward it's kind of a shame to end on it, but fighters have a subclass called samurai, so that's obviously what you're going to take. And now before we jump into spells and incantations, I just have to note that as far as all the summons that you get in the game, there are plenty of summoning spells in D&D, you just get to pick your favorite. Now, for the spells and incantations. Last I checked, there were close to 70 different sorceries, and over a hundred different incantations. And while I was particularly nervous about the sheer quantity of all of the different spells and incantations you have to worry about, frankly, most of them are just kind of variations on the same thing. So, I'm just going to run through them rapid fire. Most of your crystal based attacks are going to be covered pretty easily with Magic Missile. It's pure magic damage, and you're just kind of shooting them out willy nilly. For something like Rock Sling, you can use Telekinesis to throw a rock around. You want to use those little bubbles? Go ahead and use Chaos Bolt. You want to drop some meteors or chuck them at people? Use Melf's Minute Meteors or Meteor Swarm. If you want to boost up your weapon with any sort of elemental damage, use Elemental Weapon. If you just want to make it more magical, use Magic Weapon. If you want to surround yourself in a bunch of blades to help yourself out, use Cloud of Daggers or Blade Barrier. If you want to boost up your attacks, use Bless. If you want to block something like using Thop's Barrier, use Anti-Magic Field. If you want to recreate Zamor's Ice Storm, use Wall of Ice. If you want to make yourself invisible, there's two spells to do that. Do Invisibility or Greater Invisibility. Then if you want to create a weapon out of pure magic, you can use Shadow Blade, Blade of Disaster, or Mordenkainen Sword. There's also the spell Lucidity, which helps make sure that you're not afflicted with anything, so you can just use Greater Restoration or Lesser Restoration, depending on the severity. If you want to use Scholar's Shield to just have a magical shield, use shield or mage armor from D&D. Then for a lot of the different ice related spells, you can use Ice Knife for a Duelist Moonblade, or Glintstone Ice Crag, because they're pretty much a one-to-one -one translation. And if you want to use some of the Mist spells, Freezing Mist translates to Cone of Cold, Fia's Mist is really just Cloud Kill, and then Night Maiden's Mist can be Stinking Cloud, Poison Spray, or Cloud Kill as well. Then for more of these specialized items like Collapsing Star, you can use Pulse Wave, Gavel of Heima. I would use Bigby's Hand and translate it into a big bludgeon magical thing. Frozen Armament, you can still use Elemental Weapon, but you can also use Investiture in Ice. You also have Explosive Ghost Flame, which you can easily substitute for Circle of Death. And then for some of the stars type of things, you can use Guiding Bolt, Crown of Stars, or Call Lightning. And something like Rolling Magma, where it's a slightly delayed version, I would use Delayed Blast Fireball. And something like Ancient Death of Rancor, I would use Toll the Dead. And Eternal Darkness, I would use Gravity Sinkhole, as it really sucks things in. Now, the last spell you can't avoid talking about, Comet Azure. This lets out a giant beam in front of you, and unfortunately, it's not quite as strong, but the best way we can replicate this is either with Lightning Bolt, if you just wanted to do a single blast, or if you wanted to hold on to it and continue blasting like many people try to do in Elden Ring, I would choose Sunbeam. Just say fucking Solar Beam! I mean Venusaur! Whatever, do the Solar Beam. Yeah, okay, thanks! Venusaur! <laughs> Venusaur! <laughs> what? Oh god, my fucking knee! That's my knee! Damn it! Oh, man! Sunbeam allows you to continuously blast magic out of you in a beam directed straight from you. So now, just to make sure we cover all the Dragon Breaths, that's super, super easy. We just pick up Dragon Breath. You get to choose what element it gets to be, and granted, it doesn't quite work with the Scarlet Rot, but if you substitute that for something like Cloud Kill, it still works. Now, let's hammer through some of these incantation, as there is a lot of them. But frankly, they're all really simple. The hard ones are the blood-related ones. So the easy ones are all the different flames, and there's a ton of fire spells in D&D. You get to pick whichever one you like. There's also the Elden Ring spell Darkness, which is really just darkness in D&D. Most of these have a very easy one-to-one -one translation, so I wouldn't want to waste everybody's time going through over a hundred of these. 
So we're gonna go through the more unique ones. If you wanna boost your entire body with fire damage, I would choose Investiture of Flame. If you wanna heal your friends and family, go ahead and choose any of the many, many healing spells that D&D has to offer. If you wanna let out some epic lightning, there's plenty of cool lightning spells in D&D, like Lightning Bolt, Shocking Grasp, Call Lightning, and all sorts of other things. And if you really want to go the more blood-related route, it's rare that I ever suggest this, but there's a homebrew class for this. Usually, I would never suggest anything homebrew, but this comes straight from Matt Mercer. He has a Blood Hunter class in D&D. It's not an official source book. And usually it's kind of underpowered, which is the exact opposite of how it works in Elden Ring, because focusing on blood-related attacks in Elden Ring is pretty damn powerful. But if you really want to go that route, I highly recommend looking into Matt Mercer's Blood Hunter. That's my rapid-fire translation of Elden Ring to D&D. I know it's a little hectic and all over the place, but really I just wanted a reason to make a video about Elden Ring, as I've been pretty addicted to it lately. I'll still have my usual D&D builds coming out, and while this overall concept doesn't lend itself to just creating a single character sheet, I gotta make sure I include something for my patrons. So, if you wanna play as Let Me Solo Her, the epic Elden Ring player himself, I'll be creating a character sheet just for him, which will be available on my Patreon. Like these absolute kick-ass human beings. They help me make this stuff and help support these videos overall. So if you want to be as epically awesome as these people, feel free to check it out. Otherwise, just make sure to subscribe. That way you don't miss out on any of my ridiculous D&D builds. If you have any ridiculous builds that you want, don't forget to comment down below. I make tons of videos just based off the comments. But if there's anything you do differently in this video or any of my other videos, don't hesitate to let me know. I try and read as many of the comments as possible. And if you finally made it to the end of this video, let me know by hitting the like button, and I'll be here hoping you roll at least three nat 20s in your next D&D session. Good luck in D&D, and especially good luck if you're going up against a DM that likes Elden Ring just as much as I do.